Section One of The Wind in the Rosebush and Other Supernatural Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Addison. The Wind in the Rose Bush and Other Supernatural Stories by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. The Wind in the Rose Bush. Ford Village has no railroad station, being on the other side of the river from Porter's Falls, and accessible only by the ford which gives it its name and a ferry line the ferry boat was waiting when rebecca flint got off the train with her bag and lunch basket when she and her small trunk were safely embarked she sat stiff and straight and calm in the ferry boat as it shot swiftly and smoothly across stream there was a horse attached to a light country wagon on board and he pawed the deck uneasily. His owner stood near, with a wary eye upon him, although he was chewing, with as dully reflective an expression as a cow. Beside Rebecca sat a woman of about her own age, who kept looking at her with furtive curiosity. Her husband, short and stout and saturnine, stood near her. Rebecca paid no attention to either of them. She was tall and spare and pale, the type of a spinster, yet with rudimentary lines and expressions of matronhood. She all unconsciously held her shawl, rolled up in a canvas bag, on her left hip, as if it had been a child she wore a settled frown of dissent at life but it was the frown of a mother who regarded life as a froward child rather than as an overwhelming fate the other woman continued staring at her she was mildly stupid except for an overdeveloped curiosity which made her at times sharp beyond belief her eyes glittered, red spots came on her placid cheeks, she kept opening her mouth to speak, making little abortive motions. Finally, she could endure it no longer. She nudged Rebecca boldly. A pleasant day, said she. Rebecca looked at her and nodded coldly. Yes, very, she assented. Have you come far? I have come from Michigan. Oh, said the woman with awe. It's a long way, she remarked presently. Yes, it is, replied Rebecca conclusively. Still, the other woman was not daunted. There was something which she determined to know, possibly roused thereto, by a vague sense of incongruity in the other's appearance. "'It's a long ways to come and leave a family,' she remarked, with painful slyness. "'I ain't got any family to leave,' returned Rebecca shortly. "'Then you ain't—' "'No, I ain't.' "'Oh!' said the woman. Rebecca looked straight ahead at the race of the river. It was a long ferry. Finally, Rebecca herself waxed unexpectedly loquacious. She turned to the other woman and inquired if she knew John Dent's widow, who lived in Ford Village. Her husband died about three years ago, said she, by way of detail. The woman started violently. 
she turned pale then she flushed she cast a strange glance at her husband who was regarding both women with a sort of stolid keenness yes i guess i do faltered the woman finally well his first wife was my sister said rebecca with the air of one imparting important intelligence was she responded the other woman feebly she glanced at her husband with an expression of doubt and terror and he shook his head forbiddingly i'm going to see her and take my niece agnes home with me said rebecca then the woman gave such a violent start that she noticed it what is the matter she asked nothing i guess replied the woman with eyes on her husband who was slowly shaking his head like a chinese toy is my niece sick asked rebecca with quick suspicion no she ain't sick replied the woman with alacrity then she caught her breath with a gasp when did you see her let me see i ain't seen her for some little time replied the woman then she caught her breath again she ought to have grown up real pretty if she takes after my sister she was a real pretty woman rebecca said wistfully yeah i guess she did grow up pretty replied the woman in a trembling voice what kind of a woman is the second wife the woman glanced at her husband's warning face she continued to gaze at him while she replied in a choking voice to rebecca i guess she's a nice woman she replied i don't know i guess so i don't see much of her i felt kind of hurt that john married again so quick said rebecca but i suppose he wanted his house kept and agnes wanted care i wasn't so situated that i could take her when her mother died i had my own mother to care for and i was school teaching now mother has gone and my uncle died six months ago and left me quite a little property and i've given up my school and i've come for agnes i guess she'll be glad to go with me though i suppose her stepmother is a good woman and has always done for her the man's warning shake at his wife was fairly portentous i guess so said she john always wrote that she was a beautiful woman said rebecca then the ferry-boat grated on the shore john dent's widow had sent a horse and wagon to meet her sister-in-law when the woman and her husband went down the road on which rebecca in the wagon with her trunk soon passed them she said reproachfully seems as if i ought to have told her thomas let her find it out herself replied the man don't you go to burning your fingers in other folks puddin maria do you suppose she'll see anything asked the woman with a spasmodic shudder and a terrified roll of her eyes see returned her husband with stolid scorn better be sure there's anything to see oh thomas they say lord ain't you find out that what they say is mostly lies but if it should be true and she's a nervous woman she might be scared enough to lose her wits said his wife staring uneasily after rebecca's erect figure in the wagon disappearing over the crest of the hilly road wits that's so easy upset ain't worth much 
declared the man. You keep out of it, Maria. Rebecca, in the meantime, rode on in the wagon, beside a flaxen-headed boy, who looked, to her understanding, not very bright. She asked him a question, and he paid no attention. She repeated it, and he responded with a bewildered and incoherent grunt. Then she let him alone, after making sure that he knew how to drive straight. They had travelled about half a mile, past the village square, and gone a short distance beyond, when the boy drew up with a sudden woe before a very prosperous-looking house. It had been one of the aboriginal cottages of the vicinity, small and white, with a roof extending on one side over a piazza, and a tiny L jutting out in the rear on the right hand. Now the cottage was transformed by dormer windows, a bay window on the piazzola side, a carved railing down the front steps, and a modern hard wood door. Is this John Dunn's house? asked Rebecca. The boy was as sparing of speech as a philosopher. His only response was in flinging the reins over the horse's back, stretching out one foot to the shaft, and leaping out of the wagon, then going around to the rear for the trunk. Rebecca got out and went toward the house. Its white paint had a new gloss. Its blinds were an immaculate apple green. The lawn was trimmed as smooth as velvet, and it was dotted with scrupulous groups of hydrangeas and canners. I always understood that John Dent was well-to-do, Rebecca reflected comfortably. I guess Agnes will have considerable. I've got enough, but it will come in handy for her schooling. She can have advantages. The boy dragged the trunk up the fine gravel walk, but before he reached the steps leading up to the piazza, for the house stood on a terrace, the front door opened, and a fair, frizzled head of a very large and handsome woman appeared. She held up her black silk skirt, disclosing voluminous ruffles of starched embroidery, and waited for Rebecca. She smiled placidly, her pink, double-chinned face widened and dimpled, but her blue eyes were wary and calculating. She extended her hand as Rebecca climbed the steps. This is Miss Flint, I suppose, said she. Yes, ma'am, replied Rebecca, noticing with bewilderment a curious expression compounded of fear and defiance on the other's face. "'Your letter only arrived this morning,' said Mrs. Dent, in a steady voice. Her great face was a uniform pink, and her china-blue eyes were at once aggressive and veiled with secrecy. "'Yes, I hardly thought you'd get my letter,' replied Rebecca. "'I felt as if I could not wait to hear from you before I came.' I supposed you would be so situated that you could have me a little while without putting you out too much from what John used to write me about his circumstances, and when I had that money so unexpected, I felt as if I must come for Agnes. I suppose you will be willing to give her up. You know she's my own blood, and of course she's no relation to you, though you must have got attached to her. I know from her picture what a sweet girl she must be, and John always said she looked like her own mother, and Grace was a beautiful woman, if she was my sister. Rebecca stopped 
and stared at the other woman in amazement and alarm the great handsome blonde creature stood speechless livid gasping with her hand to her heart her lips parted in a horrible caricature of a smile are you sick cried rebecca drawing near don't you want me to get you some water then mrs dent recovered herself with a great effort it is nothing she said i am subject to spells i am over it now won't you come in miss flint as she spoke the beautiful deep rose colour suffused her face her blue eyes met her visitors with the opaqueness of turquoise with a revelation of blue but a concealment of all behind rebecca followed her hostess in and the boy who had waited quiescently climbed the steps with the trunk but before they entered the door a strange thing happened on the upper terrace close to the piazza post grew a great rose bush and on it late in the season though it was one small red perfect rose rebecca looked at it and the other woman extended her hand with a quick gesture don't you pick that rose she brusquely cried rebecca drew herself up with stiff dignity i ain't in the habit of picking other folks roses without leave said she as rebecca spoke she started violently and lost sight of her resentment for something singular happened suddenly the rose-bush was agitated violently as if by a gust of wind yet it was a remarkably still day not a leaf of the hydrangea standing on the terrace close to the rose trembled what on earth began rebecca then she stopped with a gasp at the sight of the other woman's face although a face it gave somehow the impression of a desperately clutched hand of secrecy come in said she in a harsh voice which seemed to come forth from her chest with no intervention of the organs of speech come into the house i'm getting cold out here what makes that rose-bush blow so when there isn't any wind asked rebecca trembling with vague horror yet resolute i don't see as it is blowing returned the woman calmly and as she spoke indeed the bush was quiet it was blowing declared rebecca it isn't now said mrs dent i can't try to account for everything that blows out of doors i have too much to do she spoke scornfully and confidently with defiant unflinching eyes first on the bush then on rebecca and led the way into the house it looked queer persisted rebecca but she followed and also the boy with the trunk rebecca entered an interior prosperous even elegant according to her simple ideas there were brussels carpets lace curtains and plenty of brilliant upholstery and polished wood you're real nicely situated remarked rebecca after she had become a little accustomed to her new surroundings and the two women were seated at the tea-table mrs dent stared with a hard complacency from behind her silver-plated service yes i be said she you got all the things new said rebecca hesitatingly with a jealous memory of her dead sister's bridal furnishings yes said mrs dent i was never one to want dead folks things and i had money enough of my own so i wasn't beholden to john i had the old duds put up at auction they didn't bring much 
I suppose you saved some for Agnes. She wants some of her poor mother's things when she is grown up, said Rebecca, with some indignation. The defiant stare of Mrs. Dent's blue eyes waxed more intense. There's a few things up Garrett, said she. She'll be likely to value them, remarked Rebecca. As she spoke, she glanced at the window. Isn't it most time for her to be coming home? she asked. Most time, answered Mrs. Dent carelessly. But when she gets over to Addie Slocum's, she never knows when to come home. Is Addie Slocum her intimate friend? Intimate as any. Maybe we can have her come out to see Agnes when she's living with me, said Rebecca wistfully. I suppose she'll be likely to be homesick at first. Most likely, answered Mrs. Dent. "'Does she call you mother?' Rebecca asked. "'No, she calls me Aunt Emmeline,' replied the other woman shortly. "'When did you say you were going home?' "'In about a week, I thought, if she can be ready to go so soon,' answered Rebecca, with a surprised look. She reflected that she would not remain a day longer than she could help after such an inhospitable look and question. "'Oh, as far as that goes,' said Mrs. Dent, "'it wouldn't make any difference about her being ready. "'You could go home whenever you felt that you must, "'and she could come afterward. "'Alone?' "'Why not? "'She's a big girl now, "'and you don't have to change cars. "'My niece will go home when I do, "'and not travel alone.' and if I can't wait here for her, in the house that used to be her mother's and my sister's home, I'll go and board somewhere, returned Rebecca with warmth. Oh, you can stay here as long as you want to. You're welcome, said Mrs. Dent. Then Rebecca started. There she is, she declared, in a trembling, exultant voice. Nobody knew how she longed to see the girl. "'She isn't as late as I thought she'd be,' said Mrs. Dent. And again, that curious, subtle change passed over her face, and again it settled into that stony impassiveness. Rebecca stared at the door, waiting for it to open. "'Where is she?' she asked presently. I guess she stopped to take off her hat in the entry, suggested Mrs. Dent. Rebecca waited. Why don't she come? It can't take her all this time to take off her hat. For answer, Mrs. Dent rose with a stiff jerk and threw open the door. Agnes, she called. Agnes! Then... She turned and eyed Rebecca. She ain't there. I saw her pass the window, said Rebecca in bewilderment. You must have been mistaken. I know I did, persisted Rebecca. You couldn't have. I did. I saw first the shadow go over the ceiling. Then I saw her in the glass there. She pointed to a mirror over the sideboard opposite and then the shadow passed the window. How did she look in the glass? Little and light-haired, with the light hair kind of tossing over her forehead. You couldn't have seen her. Was that like Agnes? Like enough. But of course you didn't see her. You've been thinking so much about her that you thought you did. You thought you did? I thought I saw a shadow pass the window but I must have been mistaken. She didn't come in, and we would have seen her before now. I knew it was too early for her to get home from Addie Slocum's anyhow. When Rebecca went to bed, Agnes had not returned. Rebecca 
had resolved that she would not retire until the girl came but she was very tired and she reasoned with herself that she was foolish besides mrs dent suggested that agnes might go to the church social with addy slocum when rebecca suggested that she be sent for and told that her aunt had come mrs dent laughed meaningly i guess you'll find out that a young girl ain't so ready to leave a sociable where there's boys to see her aunt said she she's too young said rebecca incredulously and indignantly she's sixteen replied mrs dent and she's always been great for the boys she's going to school four years after i get her before she thinks of boys declared rebecca we'll see laughed the other woman after rebecca went to bed she lay awake a long time listening for the sound of girlish laughter and a boy's voice under her window then she fell asleep the next morning she was down early mrs dent who kept no servants was busily preparing breakfast don't agnes help you about breakfast asked rebecca no i let her lay replied mrs dent shortly what time did she get home last night she didn't get home what she didn't get home she stayed with addy she often does without sending you word oh she knew i wouldn't worry when will she be home oh i guess she'll be along pretty soon rebecca was uneasy but she tried to conceal it for she knew of no good reason for uneasiness what was there to occasion alarm in the fact of one young girl staying overnight with another she could not eat much breakfast afterward she went out on the little piazza although her hostess strove furtively to stop her why don't you go out back of the house it's real pretty a view over the river she said i guess i'll go out here replied rebecca she had a purpose to watch for the absent girl presently rebecca came hustling into the house through the sitting-room into the kitchen where mrs dent was cooking that rosebush she gasped mrs dent turned and faced her what of it it's a blowing what of it there isn't a mite of wind this morning mrs dent turned with an inimitable toss of her fair head if you think i can spend my time puzzling over such nonsense as she began but rebecca interrupted her with a cry and a rush to the door there she is now she cried she flung the door wide open and curiously enough a breeze came in and her own grey hair tossed and a paper blew off the table to the floor with a loud rustle but there was nobody in sight there's nobody here rebecca said she looked blankly at the other woman who brought her rolling pen down on a slab of pie crust with a thud i didn't hear anybody she said calmly i saw somebody pass that window you were mistaken again i know i saw somebody you couldn't have please shut that door rebecca shut the door she sat down beside the window and looked out on the autumnal yard with its little curve of footpath to the kitchen door what smells so strong of roses in this room she said presently she sniffed hard i don't smell anything but these nutmegs it is not nutmeg i don't smell anything else where do you suppose agnes is oh perhaps she has gone over the ferry to porter's falls with addy she often does addy's got an aunt over there and addy's got a cousin a real pretty boy you suppose she's gone over there maybe i shouldn't wonder 
when should she be home oh not before afternoon rebecca waited with all the patience she could muster she kept reassuring herself telling herself that it was all natural that the other woman could not help it but she made up her mind that if agnes did not return that afternoon she should be sent for when it was four o'clock she started up with resolution she had been furtively watching the onyx clock on the sitting-room mantel she had timed herself she had said that if agnes was not home by that time she should demand that she be sent for she rose and stood before mrs dent who looked up coolly from her embroidery i've waited just as long as i'm going to she said i've come way from michigan to see my own sister's daughter and take her home with me i've been here ever since yesterday twenty-four hours and i haven't seen her now i'm going to i want her sent for mrs dent folded her embroidery and rose well i don't blame you she said it is high time she came home i'll go right over and get her myself rebecca heaved a sigh of relief she hardly knew what she had suspected or feared but she knew that her position had been one of antagonism if not accusation and she was sensible of relief i wish you would she said gratefully and went back to her chair while mrs dent got her shawl and her little white head tie i wouldn't trouble you but i do feel as if i couldn't wait any longer to see her she remarked apologetically oh it ain't any trouble at all said mrs dent as she went out i don't blame you you have waited long enough rebecca sat at the window watching breathlessly until mrs dent came stepping through the yard alone she ran to the door and saw hardly noticing it this time that the rose-bush was again violently agitated yet with no wind evident elsewhere where is she she cried mrs dent laughed with stiff lips as she came up the steps over the terrace girls will be girls said she she's gone with addy to lincoln addy's got an uncle who's conductor on the train and lives there and he got em passes and they're going to stay to addy's aunt margaret's a few days mrs slocum said agnes didn't have time to come over and ask me before the train went but she took it on herself to say it'd be all right and why hadn't she been over to tell you rebecca was angry though not suspicious she even saw no reason for her anger oh she was putting up great she was coming over just as soon as she got the black off her hands she heard i had company and her hands were a sight she was holding them over sulphur matches you say she's going to stay a few days repeated rebecca dazedly yes till thursday mrs slocum said how far is lincoln from here about fifty miles it'll be a real treat to her mrs slocum's sister is a real nice woman it is going to make it pretty late about my going home if you don't feel as if you could wait i'll get her ready and send her on just as soon as i can mrs dent said sweetly i'm going to wait said rebecca grimly the two women sat down again and mrs dent took up her embroidery is there any sewing i can do for her rebecca asked finally in a desperate way if i can get her sewing along some mrs dent arose with alacrity and fetched a mass of white from the closet here she said if you want to sew the lace on this nightgown i was going to put her to it 
but she'll be glad enough to get rid of it. She ought to have this and one more before she goes. I don't like to send her away without some good underclothing. Rebecca snatched at the little white garment and sewed feverishly. That night she wakened from a deep sleep a little after midnight and lay a minute trying to collect her faculties and explain to herself what she was listening to. At last she discovered that it was the then popular strains of the maiden's prayer floating up through the floor from the piano in the sitting-room below. She jumped up, threw a shawl over her nightgown, and hurried downstairs trembling. There was nobody in the sitting-room. The piano was silent. She ran to Mrs. Dent's bedroom, and called hysterically, Emmeline! Emmeline! What is it? asked Mrs. Dent's voice from the bed. The voice was stern, but had a note of consciousness in it. Who? Who was that playing the maiden's prayer in the sitting-room on the piano? I didn't hear anybody. There was someone. I didn't hear anything. I tell you, there was someone. But there ain't anybody there. I didn't hear anything. I did. Somebody playing the maiden's prayer on the piano. Has Agnes got home? I want to know. Of course Agnes hasn't got home, answered Mrs. Dent with rising inflection. Be you gone crazy over that girl? The last boat from Porter's Falls was in before we went to bed. Of course she ain't come. I heard you were dreaming. I wasn't. I was broad awake. Rebecca went back to her chamber and kept her lamp burning all night. The next morning her eyes upon Mrs. Dent were wary and blazing with suppressed excitement. She kept opening her mouth as if to speak, then frowning and setting her lips hard. After breakfast she went upstairs and came down presently with her coat and bonnet. Now, Emmeline, she said, I want to know where the Slocums live. Mrs. Dent gave a strange, long, half-lidded glance at her. She was finishing her coffee. Why? she asked. I'm going over there and find out if they have heard anything from her daughter and Agnes since they went away. I don't like what I heard last night. You must have been dreaming. It don't make any odds whether I was or not. Does she play the maiden's prayer on the piano? I want to know. What if she does? She plays it a little, I believe. I don't know. She don't half play it, anyhow. She ain't got an ear. That wasn't half played last night. I don't like such things happening. I ain't superstitious, but I don't like it. I'm going. Where do the Slocums live? Here go down the road, over the bridge, past the old gristmill. Then you turn to the left. It's the only house for half a mile. You can't miss it. It has a barn with a ship in full sail on the cupola. Well, I'm going. I don't feel easy. About two hours later, Rebecca returned. There were red spots on her cheeks. She looked wild. I've been there, she said, and there isn't a soul at home. Something has happened. What has happened? I don't know. Something. I had a warning last night. There wasn't a soul there. They've been sent for to Lincoln. Did you see anybody to ask? Asked Mrs. Dent, with thinly concealed anxiety. I asked the woman that lives on the turn of the road. She's stone deaf. I suppose you know. She listened while I screamed at her to know where the Slocums were. And then she said, Mrs. Smith, don't live here. I didn't see anybody on the road, and that's the only house. What do you suppose it means? I don't suppose it means much of anything, replied Mrs. Dent coolly. 
Mr. Slocum is conductor on the railroad, and he'd be away anyway, and Mrs. Slocum often goes early, when he does, to spend the day with her sister in Porter's Falls. She'd be more likely to go away than Addie. And you don't think anything has happened? Rebecca asks, with diminishing distrust, before the reasonableness of it. Land, no. Rebecca went upstairs to lay aside her coat and bonnet, but she came hurrying back with them still on. Who's been in my room? She gasped. Her face was pale as ashes. Mrs. Dent also paled as she regarded her. What do you mean? She asked slowly. I found, when I went upstairs, that that little nightgown of Agnes's on the bed laid out. It was laid out. The sleeves were folded across the bosom, and there was that little red rose between them. Emmeline, what is it? Emmeline, what's the matter? Oh! Mrs. Dent was struggling for breath in great choking gasps. She clung to the back of a chair. Rebecca, trembling herself so she could scarcely keep on her feet, got her some water. As soon as she recovered herself, Mrs. Dent regarded her with eyes full of the strangest mixture of fear and horror and hostility. "'What do you mean, talking so?' she said in a hard voice. "'It is there!' "'Nonsense! You threw it down, and it fell that way. It was folded in my bureau drawer. It couldn't have been. Who picked that red rose?' "'Look on the bush. Mrs. Dent replied shortly. Rebecca looked at her. Her mouth gaped. She hurried out of the room. When she came back, her eyes seemed to protrude. She had, in the meantime, hastened upstairs and come down with tottering steps, clinging to the banisters. Now I want to know what all this means, she demanded. What what means? The rose is on the bush, and it's gone from the bed in my room. Is this house haunted, or what? I don't know anything about a house being haunted. I don't believe in such things. Be you crazy? Mrs. Dent spoke with gathering force. The colour flashed back to her cheeks. No, said Rebecca shortly. I ain't crazy yet, but I shall be if this keeps on much longer. I'm going to find out where that girl is before night. Mrs. Dent eyed her. What be you going to do? I'm going to Lincoln. A faint, triumphant smile overspread Mrs. Dent's large face. You can't, said she. There ain't any train. No train? No, there ain't any afternoon train from the falls to Lincoln. Then... I'm going over to the Slocums again tonight. However, Rebecca did not go. Such a rain came up as deterred even her resolution, and she had only her best dresses with her. Then, in the evening, came the letter from the Michigan village, which she had left nearly a week ago. It was from her cousin, a single woman, who had come to keep her house while she was away. It was a pleasant, unexciting letter enough, all the first of it, and related mostly how she missed Rebecca, how she hoped she was having pleasant weather and kept her health, and how her friend, Mrs. Greenaway, had come to stay with her since she had felt lonesome the first night in the house, how she hoped Rebecca would have no objections to this, although nothing had been said about it since she had not realized that she might be nervous alone. The cousin was painfully conscientious, hence the letter. Rebecca smiled, in spite of her disturbed mind as she read it. Then her eye caught the postscript. That was in a different hand, purporting to be written by the friend, Mrs. Hannah Greenaway, informing her that the cousin had fallen down the cellar stairs and broken her hip and was in a dangerous condition. 
and begging Rebecca to return at once, as she herself was rheumatic and unable to nurse her properly, and no one else could be obtained. Rebecca looked at Mrs. Dent, who had come to her room with the letter quite late. It was half-past nine, and she had gone upstairs for the night. "'Where did this come from?' she asked. "'Mr. Amblecrom brought it,' she replied. "'Who's he?' "'The postmaster. He often brings the letters that come on the late mail. He knows I ain't anybody to send. He brought yours about your coming. He said he and his wife came over on the ferry boat with you. "'I remember him,' Rebecca replied shortly. "'There's bad news in this letter.' Mrs. Dent's face took on an expression of serious inquiry. "'Yes, my cousin Harriet has fallen down the cellar stairs. They were always dangerous, and she's broken her hip, and I've got to take the first train home tomorrow.' "'You don't say so. I'm dreadfully sorry.' "'No, you ain't sorry,' said Rebecca, with a look as if she leaped. "'You're glad.' I don't know why, but you're glad. You've wanted to get rid of me for some reason ever since I came. I don't know why. You're a strange woman. Now you've got your way, and I hope you're satisfied. How you talk. Mrs. Dent spoke in a faintly injured voice, but there was a light in her eyes. I talk the way it is. Well, I'm going tomorrow morning, and I want you just as soon as Agnes Dent comes home, to send her out to me. Don't you wait for anything. You pack what clothes she's got, and don't wait even to mend them, and you buy her ticket. I'll leave the money, and you send her along. She don't have to change cars. You start her off when she gets home on the next train. Very well, replied the other woman. She had an expression of covert amusement. Mind you do it. Very well, Rebecca. Rebecca started on her journey the next morning. When she arrived two days later, she found her cousin in perfect health. She found, moreover, that the friend had not written the postscript in the cousin's letter. Rebecca would have returned to Ford Village the next morning, but the fatigue and nervous strain had been too much for her she was not able to move from her bed. She had a species of low fever induced by anxiety and fatigue. But she could write, and she did, to the Slocums, and she received no answer. She also wrote to Mrs. Dent. She even sent numerous telegrams with no response. Finally, she wrote to the postmaster, and an answer arrived by the first possible mail. The letter was short, cut and to the purpose. Mr. Amblecrum, the postmaster, was a man of few words, and especially wary as to his expressions in a letter. Dear Madam, he wrote, your favour received. No Slocums in Ford's village. All dead. Addie, ten years ago. Her mother, two years later. Her father, five. House vacant. Mrs. John Dent, said to have neglected stepdaughter. Girl was sick, medicine not given, talk of taking action, not enough evidence. House said to be haunted, strange sights and sounds. Your niece, Agnes Dent, died a year ago, about this time. Yours truly, Thomas Amblecrum. End of section one. Section two of The Wind in the Rosebush and Other Stories of the Supernatural. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wind in the Rosebush, and Other Stories of the Supernatural, by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. 
the shadows on the wall. Henry had words with Edward in the study the night before Edward died, said Carolyn Glynn. She was elderly, tall, and harshly thin, with a hard colorlessness of face. She spoke not with acrimony, but with grave severity. Rebecca Ann Glynn, younger, stouter, and rosy of face between her crinkling puffs of gray hair, gasped by way of assent. She sat in a wide flounce of black silk in the corner of the sofa, and rolled terrified eyes from her sister Caroline to her sister Mrs. Stephen Brigham, who had been Emma Glynn, the one beauty of the family. She was beautiful still, with a large, splendid, full-blown beauty. She filled a great rocking chair with a superb bulk of femininity and swayed gently back and forth, her black silks whispering and her black frills fluttering. Even the shock of death, for her brother Edward lay dead in the house, could not disturb her outward serenity of demeanor. She was grieved over the loss of her brother. He had been the youngest, and she had been fond of him, but never had Emma Brigham lost sight of her own importance amidst the waters of tribulation. She was always awake to the consciousness of her own stability in the midst of vicissitudes and the splendor of her permanent bearing. But even her expression of masterly placidity changed before her sister Caroline's announcement and her sister Rebecca Ann's gasps of terror and distress in response. "'I think Henry might have controlled his temper when poor Edward was so near his end,' said she with an asperity which disturbed slightly the roseate curves of her beautiful mouth. "'Of course he did not know,' murmured Rebecca Ann in a faint tone strangely out of keeping with her appearance. One involuntarily looked again to be sure that such a feeble pipe came from that full-swelling chest. "'Of course he did not know it,' said Caroline quickly. She turned on her sister with a strange, sharp look of suspicion. "'How could he have known it?' said she. Then she shrank as if from the other's possible answer. "'Of course, you and I both know he could not,' she said conclusively. But her pale face was paler than it had been before. Rebecca gasped again. The married sister, Mrs. Emma Brigham, was now sitting up straight in her chair. She had ceased rocking, and was eyeing them both intently, with a sudden accentuation of family likeness in her face. Given one common intensity of emotion, and similar lines showed forth, and the three sisters of one race were evident. "'What do you mean?' said she impartially to them both. Then she, too, seemed to shrink before a possible answer. She even laughed an evasive sort of laugh. "'I guess you don't mean anything,' said she. But her face wore still the expression of shrinking horror. "'Nobody means anything,' said Caroline firmly. She rose and crossed the room toward the door with grim decisiveness. "'Where are you going?' asked Mrs. Brigham. "'I have something to see to.' replied Caroline, and the others at once knew by her tone that she had some solemn and sad duty to perform in the chamber of death. Oh, said Mrs. Brigham. After the door had closed behind Caroline, she turned to Rebecca. Did Henry have many words with him? she asked. They were talking very loud, replied Rebecca evasively yet with an answering gleam of ready response to the other's curiosity and the quick lift of her soft blue eyes. Mrs. Brigham looked at her. She had not resumed rocking. She still sat up straight with a slight knitting of intensity on her fair forehead, between the pretty rippling curves of her auburn hair. "'Did you hear anything?' she asked in a low voice with a glance toward her door. "'I was just across the hall in the south parlor,' "'And that door was open, and this door ajar,' replied Rebecca with a slight flush. "'Then you must have. I couldn't help it. Everything? Most of it? What was it? The old story. I suppose Henry was mad, as he always was, because Edward was living on here for nothing when he had wasted all the money father left him.' Rebecca nodded with a fearful glance at the door. When Emma spoke again— her voice was still more hushed. "'I know how he felt,' said she. 
he had always been so prudent himself and worked hard at his profession and there edward had never done anything but spend and it must have looked to him as if edward was living at his expense uh, but he wasn't no he wasn't it was the way father left the property that all the children should have a home here and he left money enough to buy the food and all if we had all come home yes and edward had a right here according to the term of father's will and henry ought to have remembered it yes he ought did he say hard things pretty hard from what i heard what i heard him tell edward that he had no business here at all and he thought he had better go away what did edward say that he would stay here as long as he lived and afterward too if he was a mind to and he would like to see henry get him out and then what then he laughed what did henry say i didn't hear him say anything but but what i saw him when he came out of this room he looked mad you've seen him when he looked so emma nodded the expression of horror on her face had deepened do you remember that time he killed the cat because she had scratched him yes oh, don't then caroline re-entered the room she went up to the stove in which a wood fire was burning it was a cold gloomy day of fall and she warmed her hands which were reddened from recent washing in cold water mrs brigham looked at her and hesitated she glanced at the door which was still ajar as it did not easily shut being still swollen with the damp weather of the summer she rose and pushed it together with a sharp thud which jarred the house rebecca started painfully with a half exclamation caroline looked at her disapprovingly it is time you controlled your nerves rebecca said she i can't help it replied rebecca with almost a wail i am nervous that's enough to make me so the lord knows what do you mean by that asked caroline with her old air of sharp suspicion and something between challenge and dread of its being met rebecca shrank nothing said she then i wouldn't keep speaking in such a fashion emma returning from the closed door said imperiously that it ought to be fixed it shut so hard it will shrink enough after we had the fire a few days replied caroline if anything is done to it it will be too small there will be a crack at the sill i think henry ought to be ashamed of himself for talking as he did to edward said mrs brigham abruptly but in an almost inaudible voice hush said caroline with a glance of actual fear at the closed door nobody can hear with the door shut he must have heard it shut and well i can say what i want to before he comes down and i am not afraid of him i don't know who is afraid of him what reason is there for anybody to be afraid of henry demanded caroline mrs brigham trembled before her sister's look rebecca gasped again there isn't any reason of course why should there be i wouldn't speak so then somebody might overhear you and think it was queer miranda joy is in the south parlor sewing you know i thought she went upstairs to stitch on the machine she did but she has come down again well she can't hear i say again i think henry ought to be ashamed of himself i shouldn't think he'd ever get over it having words with poor edward the very night before he died edward was enough sight better disposition than henry with all his faults i always thought a great deal of poor edward myself mrs brigham passed a large fluff of handkerchief across her eyes rebecca sobbed outright rebecca said caroline admonishingly keeping her mouth stiff and swallowing determinately i never heard him speak a cross word unless he spoke to cross to henry that last night i don't know but he did from what rebecca overheard said emma not so much cross as sort of soft and sweet and, and aggravating sniffled rebecca he never raised his voice said caroline but he had his way he had a right to in this case yes he did he has much of a right here as henry sobbed rebecca and now he's gone and he will never be in this home the poor father left him and the rest of us again 
"'What do you think really ailed, Edward?' asked Emma in hardly more than a whisper. She did not look at her sister. Caroline sat down in a nearby armchair and clutched the arms convulsively until her thin knuckles whitened. I told you, said she. Rebecca held her handkerchief over her mouth and looked at them above it with terrified, streaming eyes. I know you said that he had terrible pains in his stomach and had spasms, but what do you think made him have them? Henry called it gastric trouble. You know Edward has always had dyspepsia. Mrs. Brigham hesitated a moment. Was there any talk of an examination? said she. Then Caroline turned on her fiercely. No, she said in a terrible voice. No. The three sisters' souls seemed to meet on one common ground of terrified understanding through their eyes. The old-fashioned latch of the door was heard to rattle, and a push from without made the door shake ineffectually. It's Henry, Rebecca sighed rather than whispered. Mrs. Brigham settled herself after a noiseless rush across the floor into her rocking chair again, and was swaying back and forth with her head comfortably leaning back, when the door at last yielded and Henry Glynn entered. He cast a covertly sharp, comprehensive glance at Mrs. Brigham with her elaborate calm, at Rebecca quietly huddled in the corner of the sofa with her handkerchief to her face, and only one small reddened deer, as attentive as a dog's, uncovered and revealing her alertness to his presence, at Caroline sitting with a strained composure in her armchair by the stove. She met his eyes quite firmly with a look of inscrutable fear, and defiance of the fear, and of him. Henry Glynn looked more like this sister than the others. Both had the same delicacy of form and feature. Both were tall and almost emaciated. Both had a sparse growth of grey-blond hair far back from high, intellectual foreheads. Both had an almost noble aquilinity of feature. They confronted each other with the pitiless immovability of two statues, in whose marble lineaments emotions were fixed for all eternity. Then Henry Glynn smiled, and the smile transformed his face. He looked suddenly years younger, and an almost boyish recklessness and irresolution appeared in his face. He flung himself into a chair, with a gesture which was bewildering from his incongruity with his general appearance. He leaned his head back, flung one leg over the other, and looked laughingly at Mrs. Brigham. "'I declare, Emma, you grow younger every year,' he said. She flushed a little, and her placid mouth widened at the corners. She was susceptible to praise. "'Our thoughts today ought to belong to the one of us who will never grow older,' said Caroline in a hard voice. Henry looked at her, still smiling. "'Of course we none of us forget that,' said he in a deep, gentle voice. "'But we have to speak to the living, Caroline. "'And I have not seen Emma for a long time. "'And the living are as dear as the dead.' "'Not to me,' said Caroline. "'She rose and went abruptly out of the room again. "'Rebecca also rose and hurried after her, sobbing loudly. "'Henry looked slowly after them. Caroline is completely unstrung, said he. Mrs. Brigham rocked. A confidence in him inspired by his manner was stealing over her. Out of that confidence she spoke quite easily and naturally. His death was very sudden, said she. Henry's eyelids quivered slightly, but his gaze was unswerving. Yes, said he. It was very sudden. He was sick only a few hours. What did you call it? Gastric. You did not think of an examination. There was no need. I am perfectly certain as to the cause of his death. Suddenly Mrs. Brigham felt a creep as of some live horror over her very soul. Her flesh prickled with cold before an inflection of his voice. She rose, tottering on weak knees. "'Where are you going?' asked Henry in a strange, breathless voice. "'Mrs. Brigham said something incoherent about some sewing, which she had to do. "'Some black for the funeral. 
and was out of the room. She went up to the front chamber which she occupied. Caroline was there. She went close to her and took her hands, and the two sisters looked at each other. Don't speak. Don't. I won't have it, said Caroline finally in an awful whisper. I won't, replied Emma. That afternoon, the three sisters were in the study, the large front room on the ground floor across the hall from the south parlor, when the dust deepened. Mrs. Brigham was hemming some black material. She sat close to the west window for the waning light. At last she laid her work on her lap. "'It's no use. I cannot see to sew another stitch until we have a light,' said she. Caroline, who was writing some letters at the table, turned to Rebecca in her usual place on the sofa. "'Rebecca, you had better get a lamp,' she said. Rebecca started up. Even in the dusk her face showed her agitation. "'It doesn't seem to me that we need a lamp quite yet,' she said in a piteous, pleading voice like a child's. "'Yes, we do,' returned Mrs. Brigham preemptorily. "'We must have a light. I must finish this tonight, or I can't go to the funeral, and I can't see to sew another stitch.' "'Caroline can see to write letters, and she is farther from the window than you are,' said Rebecca. "'Are you trying to save kerosene, or are you lazy, Rebecca Glynn?' cried Mrs. Brigham. "'I can go and get the light myself, but I have this work all in my lap.' Caroline's pen stopped scratching. "'Rebecca, we must have the light,' said she. "'Had we better have it in here?' asked Rebecca weakly. "'Of course! Why not?' cried Caroline sternly. "'I am sure I don't want to take my sewing into the other room when it is all cleaned up for tomorrow,' said Mrs. Brigham. "'Why, I never heard such a to-do about lighting a lamp!' Rebecca rose and left the room. Presently she entered with a lamp, a large one with a white porcelain shade. She set it on a table, an old-fashioned card table which was placed against the opposite wall from the window. That wall was clear of bookcases and books, which were only on three sides of the room. That opposite wall was taken up with three doors, the one small space being occupied by the table. Above the table, in the old-fashioned wallpaper, of a white satin gloss, traversed by an indeterminate green scroll, hung quite high a small gilt and black-framed ivory miniature taken in her girlhood of the mother of the family. When the lamp was set on the table beneath it, the tiny pretty face painted on the ivory seemed to gleam out with a look of intelligence. "'What have you put that lamp over there for?' asked Mrs. Brigham, with more of impatience than her voice usually revealed. "'Why didn't you sit in the hall and have done with it? Neither Caroline nor I can see if it is on that table.' "'I thought perhaps you would move,' replied Rebecca hoarsely. "'If I do move, we can't both sit at that table. Caroline has her paper all spread around.' Why don't you set the lamp on the study table in the middle of the room? Then we can both see. Rebecca hesitated. Her face was very pale. She looked with an appeal that was fairly agonizing at her sister Caroline. Why don't you put the lamp on this table as she says, said Caroline almost fiercely. Why do you act so, Rebecca? I should think that you would ask her that, said Mrs. Brigham. She doesn't act like herself at all. Rebecca took the lamp and set it on the table in the middle of the room without another word. Then she turned her back upon it quickly and seated herself on the sofa, and placed a hand over her eyes as if to shade them, and remained so. "'Does the light hurt your eyes? And is that the reason why you didn't want the lamp?' asked Mrs. Brigham kindly. "'I always like to sit in the dark,' replied Rebecca chokingly. Then she snatched her handkerchief hastily from her pocket and began to weep. Caroline continued to write, Mrs. Brigham to sew. Suddenly Mrs. Brigham, as she sewed, glanced at the opposite wall. The glance became a steady stare. She looked intently, her work suspended in her hands. Then she looked away again and took a few more stitches. Then she looked again and again returned to her task. At last she laid her work in her lap and stared concentratedly. She looked from the wall around the room, taking note of the various objects. She looked at the wall long and intently. 
Then she turned to her sisters. What is that? said she. What? asked Caroline harshly. Her pen scratched loudly across the paper. Rebecca gave one of her convulsive gasps. That strange shadow on the wall, replied Mrs. Brigham. Rebecca sat with her face hidden. Caroline dipped her pen in the inkstand. Why don't you turn around and look? asked Mrs. Brigham in a wondering and somewhat aggrieved way. I am in a hurry to finish this letter if Mrs. Wilson Ebbe is going to get word in time to come to the funeral, replied Caroline shortly. Mrs. Brigham rose, her work slipping to the floor, and she began walking around the room, moving various articles of furniture with her eyes on the shadow. Then suddenly she shrieked out, Look at this awful shadow! What is it, Caroline? Look! Look! Rebecca, look! What is it? All of Miss Springham's triumphant placidity was gone. Her handsome face was livid with horror. She stood stiffly pointing at the shadow. Look! said she, pointing her finger at it. Look! What is it? Then Rebecca burst out into a wild wail after a shuddering glance at the wall. Oh, Caroline, there it is again! There it is again! Caroline Glynn, you look, said Mrs. Brigham. Look! What is that dreadful shadow? Caroline rose, turned, and stood confronting the wall. How should I know? she said. It has been there every night since he died, cried Rebecca. Every night? Yes. He died Thursday, and this is Saturday. That makes three nights, said Caroline rigidly. She stood as if holding herself calm with a vice of concentrated will. It, it looks like, like, stammered Mrs. Brigham in a tone of intense horror. I know what it looks like well enough, said Caroline. I've got eyes in my head. It looks like Edward, burst out Ed Rebecca in a sort of frenzy of fear. Only, yes, it does assented Mrs. Brigham, whose horror shook into her sisters, only, oh, it is awful. What is it, Caroline? I ask you again, how should I know, replied Caroline. I see it there like you. How should I know any more than you? It must be something in the room, said Mrs. Brigham, staring wildly around. We moved everything in the room in the first night it came, said Rebecca. It is not anything in the room. Caroline turned upon her with a sort of fury. Of course it is something in the room, said she. How you act! What do you mean by talking so? Of course it is something in the room. Uh, of course it is, agreed Mrs. Brigham, looking at Caroline suspiciously. Uh, of course it must be. It is only a coincidence. It just happens so. Perhaps it is that fold of the window curtain that makes it. It m must be something in the room. It is not anything in the room repeated Rebecca with obstinate horror. The door opened suddenly and Henry Glynn entered. He began to speak, then his eyes followed the direction of the others. He stood stock still, staring at the shadow on the wall. It was life-size, and stretched across the white parallelogram of a door, half across the wall space in which the picture hung. What? Is that? he demanded in a strange voice. It, it must be due to something in the room, Mrs. Brigham said faintly. It is not due to anything in the room, said Rebecca again with the shrill insistency of terror. How you act, Rebecca Glynn, said Caroline. Henry Glynn stood and stared a moment longer. His face showed a gamut of emotions. Horror, conviction, then furious incredulity. Suddenly he began hastening hither and thither about the room. He moved the furniture with fierce jerks, turning ever to see the effect upon the shadow on the wall. Not a line of its terrible outlines wavered. It must be something in the room, he declared in a voice which seemed to snap like a lash. His face changed. The inmost secrecy of his nature seemed evident until one almost lost sight of his lineaments. Rebecca stood close to her sofa, regarding him with a woeful, fascinated eyes. Mrs. Brigham clutched Caroline's hand. 
they both stood in a corner out of the, his way. For a few moments he raged about the room like a caged wild animal. He moved every piece of furniture. When the moving of a piece did not affect the shadow, he flung it to the floor, the sisters watching. Then suddenly he desisted. He laughed and began straightening the furniture which he had flung down. What an absurdity, he said easily. Such a to-do about a shadow. That's so, assented Mrs. Brigham, in a scared voice which she tried to make natural. As she spoke, she lifted a chair near her. I think that you have broken the chair that Edward was so fond of, said Caroline. Terror and wrath were struggling for expression on her face. Her mouth was set, her eyes shrinking. Henry lifted the chair with a show of anxiety. Just as good as ever, he said pleasantly. He laughed again, looking at his sisters. Did I scare you? he said. I should think you might be used to me by this time. You know my way of wanting to leap at the bottom of a mystery, and that shadow does look queer-like, and I thought if there was any way of accounting for it, I would like to without any delay. You don't seem to have succeeded, remarked Caroline dryly with a slight glance at the wall. Henry's eyes followed hers, and he quivered perceptively. Oh, there is no accounting for shadows, he said, and he laughed again. A man is a fool to try to account for shadows. Then the supper bell rang, and they all left the room. But Henry kept his back to the wall, as did, indeed, the others. Mrs. Brigham pressed close to Caroline as she crossed the hall. He looked like a demon, she breathed in her ear. Henry led the way with an alert motion like a boy. Rebecca brought up the rear. She could scarcely walk, her knees trembled so. I won't sit in that room again after this evening, she whispered to Caroline after supper. Very well, we will sit in the south room, replied Caroline. I think we will sit in the south parlor, she said aloud. It isn't as damp as the study, and I have a cold. So they all sat in the south room with their sewing. Henry read the newspaper his chair drawn close to the lamp on the table. About nine o'clock he rose abruptly and crossed the hall to the study. The three sisters looked at one another. Mrs. Brigham rose, folding her rustling skirts compactly around her, and began tiptoeing toward the door. "'What are you going to do?' inquired Rebecca agitatedly. "'I am going to see what he is about,' replied Mrs. Brigham cautiously. She pointed as she spoke to the study door across the hall. It was ajar. Henry had striven to pull it together behind him, but it somehow swollen beyond the limit with curious speed. It was still ajar, and a streak of light showed from top to bottom. The hall lamp was not lit. You had better stay where you are, said Caroline with guarded sharpness. I am going to see, repeated Mrs. Brigham firmly. Then she folded her skirt so tightly that her bulk with its swelling curves was revealed in a black silk sheath, and she went with a slow toddle across the hall to the study door. She stood there, her eye at the crack. In the south room, Rebecca stopped sewing and sat watching with dilated eyes. Caroline sewed steadily, but Mrs. Brigham, standing at the crack in the study door, saw was this. Henry Glynn, evidently reasoning that the source of the strange shadow must be between the table on which the lamp stood and the wall, was making systemic passes and thrusts all over and through the intervening space with an old sword which had belonged to his father. Not an inch was left unpierced. He seemed to have divided the space into mathematical sections. He brandished the sword with a sort of cold fury and calculation. The blade gave out flashes of light. The shadow remained unmoved. Mrs. Brigham, watching, felt herself cold with horror. Finally, Henry ceased, and stood with the sword in hand and raised as if to strike, surveying the shadow on the wall threateningly. Mrs. Brigham toddled back across the hall and shut the south room door behind her before she related what she had seen. He looked like a demon, she said again. Have you got any of that old wine in the house, Caroline? I don't feel as if I could stand much more. Indeed, she looked overcome. 
Her handsome, placid face was worn and strained and pale. Yes, there's plenty, said Caroline. You can have some when you go to bed. I think we had all better take some, said Mrs. Brigham. Oh, my God, Caroline, what? Don't ask and don't speak, said Caroline. No, I am not going to, replied Mrs. Brigham, but Rebecca moaned aloud. What are you doing that for? asked Caroline harshly. Poor Edward, returned Rebecca. That is all you have to groan for, said Caroline. There is nothing else. I am going to bed, said Mrs. Brigham. I shan't be able to be at the funeral if I don't. Soon the three sisters went to their chambers, and the south parlor was deserted. Caroline called to Henry in the study to put out the light before he came upstairs. They had been gone about an hour when he came into the room, bringing the lamp which had stood in the study. He set it on the table and waited a few minutes, pacing up and down. His face was terrible. His fair complexion showed livid. His blue eyes seemed dark blanks of awful reflections. Then he took the lamp up and returned to the library. He set the lamp on the center table, and the shadow sprang out on the wall. Again he studied the furniture and moved it about, but deliberately, with none of his formal frenzy. Nothing affected the shadow. Then he returned to the south room with the lamp again, and again waited. Again he returned to the study and placed the lamp on the table, and the shadow sprang out upon the wall. It was midnight before he went upstairs. Mrs. Brigham, the other sisters, who could not sleep, heard him. The next day was the funeral. That evening the family sat in the south room. Some relatives were with them. Nobody entered the study until Henry carried a lamp in there after the others had retired for the night. He saw again the shadow on the wall leap to an awful life before the light. The next morning at breakfast, Henry Glynn announced that he had to go to the city for three days. The sisters looked at him with surprise. He very seldom left home, and just now his practice had been neglected on account of Edward's death. He was a physician. How can you leave your patients now? asked Mrs. Brigham wonderingly. I don't know how to, but there is no other way, replied Henry easily. I have had a telegram from Dr. Mitford. Consultation? inquired Mrs. Brigham. I have business, replied Henry. Dr. Mitford was an old classmate of his who lived in a neighboring city, and who occasionally called upon him in the case of a consultation. After he had gone, Mrs. Brigham said to Caroline that after all Henry had not said that he was going to consult with Dr. Mitford, and she thought it very strange. Everything is very strange, said Rebecca with a shudder. What do you mean? inquired Caroline sharply. Nothing, replied Rebecca. Nobody entered the library that day, nor the next, nor the next. The third day Henry was expected home, but he did not arrive, and the last train from the city had come. I call it pretty queer work, said Mrs. Brigham. The idea of a doctor leaving his patients for three days anyhow, at such a time as this, and I know you some some sick ones. He said so. And the idea of a consultation lasting three days! There is no sense in it, and now he has not come. I don't understand it for my part. I don't either, said Rebecca. They were all in the south parlor. There was no light in the study opposite, and the door was ajar. Presently Mrs. Ringham rose. She could not have told why. Something seemed to impel her some will outside her own. She went out of the room, again wrapping her rustling skirts around that she might pass noiselessly, and began pushing at the swollen door of the study. She has not got any lamp, said Rebecca in a shaking voice. Caroline, who was writing letters, rose again, took a lamp, there were two in the room, and followed her sister. Rebecca had risen, but she stood trembling, not venturing to follow. The doorbell rang, but the others did not hear it. It was on the south door on the other side of the house from the study, 
Rebecca, after hesitating until the bell rang the second time, went to the door. She remembered that the servant was out. Caroline and her sister Emma entered the study. Caroline set the lamp on the table. They looked at the wall. Oh, my God, gasped Mrs. Brigham. There are... There are two shadows. The sisters stood clutching each other, staring at the awful things on the wall. Then Rebecca came in, staggering, with a telegram in her hand. Here is a telegram, she gasped. Henry is dead. End of section two.